So today I'm going to be talking about gluten-free diet mistakes. Uh, before we take questions, um, if you've got questions about the gluten-free diet or the grain-free diet, no grain, no pain protocols, uh, I want you to go ahead and type them in or chime them in as well because I'm going to make sure I get as many of those answers answered today as I can. But I want to talk about some of the strategies and some of the pitfalls and the downfalls of, of why people go on a gluten-free diet and say, hey, this doesn't work for me or, hey, this diet is not the right diet for me, why it fails for them. So um, let's let's go through those. The, the first, probably the biggest mistake that um, that I see people making is they shop the gluten-free food aisle. And let's talk about why that is. The gluten-free food aisle itself is, is probably the most toxic section of the grocery store. And what I mean by that is, what, what are we left with? What is on the gluten-free food aisle? 99% of those products, yes, they are gluten-free if we look at the old 1952 definition of what gluten is. But you know, most of those products are highly, highly processed, highly refined foods with added hydrogenated fats, which are unhealthy, with added sugars, which are unhealthy. But many of them also contain grains, grains like oats, which are classically considered a gluten-free grain. Some of them contain grains like corn or rice. Again, classically considered gluten-free, but technically not gluten-free at all. So when we're looking at, you know, at, at somebody going down that aisle and buying the gluten-free corn-based spaghetti or rice-based spaghetti, or they're going down the aisle and buying the corn pop uh, cereal, or they're buying the, uh, the bread products that are primarily predominantly made from corn and rice uh, or other grain-based items. And they're eating these now as staple foods. You got to understand why those things are problematic. Why is corn, why is rice, why are oats problematic? Well, oats one of the problems with oats is they do contain a, a type of gluten that, although hasn't been studied as well as the gliadin, the type of gluten found in wheat, barley, and rye, has been studied well enough to know that we do see people eating oats where there, where there is damage. Even the certified gluten-free oats, even the ones that are being claimed to not be cross-contaminated, even the ones that, are, are, that have on the label certified gluten-free, no gluten ever touched this product from wheat, barley, rye, not processed in a facility where we also process wheat, barley, rye. So even those grains can create severe inflammatory damage. I've seen this happen in countless patients. And uh, and so if you're going on this gluten-free diet and, and, you, and you're eating oatmeal, for example, certified gluten-free oatmeal every morning, or you're eating some type of, uh, of oat-based product on a daily or regular basis, you're going to continue to struggle uh, as a result of, of that exposure. Now, then you also have corn and rice. Now, corn has a form of gluten in it called zine, and that it's, you know, you've heard the term, maybe you've heard the term corn gluten. And some people say, well, they're not the same thing. Well, understand what gluten is. Gluten, by definition, is it is a family of proteins found in grains, in the seeds of grass, which are what grains are. And if we are consuming corn, yes, it is technically alpha gliadin free, which is the type of gluten that a lot of doctors refer to as it relates to celiac disease. But if you're consuming grains on a regular basis, what tends to end up happening is, um, you're, especially with the corn, is you're getting that corn exposure. And that corn exposure with the zinc oftentimes will trigger the same type of inflammatory response in the GI tract. So we're seeing people with these corn-based exposures having just as bad of a chronic inflammatory process when they're eating corn, things like popcorn, things like cornbread, things like uh, the different, again, the different types of corn-based products. So you have to be super careful. Um, and in my experience and in my advice, you've got to avoid the corn, you've got to avoid the grain. So the other problem with corn is that it's doused in glyphosate, which is an herbicide. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here shortly. Then you've got rice, rice-based products. Now, rice-based products do contain a form of gluten. Rice contains a form of gluten. It is the lowest, um, by concentration, rice has the lowest quantity of gluten of all the grains, but it still has a form of gluten in it. Now, that's called orizin. And this particular type of gluten, again, it, there have been studies that show that it can be detrimental to those with gluten sensitivity, especially there have been a number of studies showing that rice protein causes something called FPIES, F-P-I-E-S. That stands for food protein-induced enterocolitis. Now, enterocolitis is just a fancy way of saying 
inflammation in the colon. So we know rice protein can do this, and we know it can do this in a very big way. There have been a number of studies showing that, um, that rice is nowhere near as hypoallergenic as what we, what we once thought it was. So rice can be a very big problem for many of you as well. Now, rice is also oftentimes a problem as it relates to its ability to pull heavy toxic metals from the soil. So rice can be high in lead, it can be high in arsenic, it can be high in cadmium, and these heavy metals can cause disruption of your biochemistry. Many of these heavy metals can cause iron deficiency anemias that can cause calcium and magnesium and zinc problems. So you end up, uh, you end up in a state where your body is behaving as if it's calcium deficient or zinc or magnesium or iron deficient. And so those can be, again, major problems associated with rice consumption. So if you're, again, the biggest mistake we'll see people making when they're going on a gluten-free diet is they go shop the gluten-free aisle and they're just replacing the breads, pasta, cereals that are wheat, barley, or rye derived with breads, pastas, or cereals that are oat, corn, or rice derived. And that's, again, that's a huge mistake because all grains by definition contain a form of gluten and remember, gluten is not just alpha gliadin. Again, doctors refer to celiac disease and gluten as only one type of gluten protein called alpha gliadin. And this protein was discovered in 1952. If you've seen my PBS special, I talked all about the history of grain and, and how this happened. And if you've read my book, No Grain, No Pain, I go into even more detail and list the references within that book. So if you haven't read No Grain, No Pain, definitely you need to go make sure you go back and read that as well to get reinforcement of what we're talking about in this video today. Okay, let's go on to the next segment, which is gluten mimicking foods. This is one of the other big mistakes or big problems that people have. One of the biggest gluten mimicking foods is dairy. Now, dairy, why dairy? Because Dairy, it's one, it's the way the cows are, um, the way the cow's milk itself is being processed. So understand that a lot of our cows today, especially the Holstein variety of cows, there's a genetic manipulation in these cows and these breeds of cows. So when they're producing milk, the protein in the milk is called casein, one of the main proteins, C-A-S-E-I-N, casein. And this, from a genetically modified cow perspective, the casein and this dairy tends to look a lot like gluten. So a lot of people have a cross reactivity, meaning they react to the dairy the same way they might react to the gluten because the casein and the gluten are so similar and they both incite the immune system's response, creating an inflammatory cascade of problems. So dairy can be a major, major trigger. So if you're going gluten free and you're consuming a lot of cheese, a lot of butter, a lot of dairy products, this is where you might be getting in trouble. My advice when somebody is initially going gluten-free, now this is just you know, generalized advice. If you're in my clinic, I'd give you very specific advice, but my generalized advice on this is if you're going gluten-free, you really need to go dairy-free for at least the first six months um, before you can really truly get a, a handle on whether or not dairy is gonna be a major problem for you. Remember, the, the, most of the cows, most of the dairy is coming from genetically modified cows. Much of the dairy has recombinant bovine growth hormone or other hormones or other chemicals added to it that are healthy, that are not good for humans. And remember, if, why is a person going gluten-free? Most people don't go gluten-free because they're trying to, well, let me rephrase that. Most people don't go gluten-free because they just want to join the fad. Most people go gluten-free because they have a major health issue they're trying to overcome. And the pain of that health issue is greater than the pain of the need to, take, to change the diet. So if you're changing your diet already, you know, I mean, I might be saying, you might be hearing me say, go dairy free too. And that might be mind blowing to you. Like how in the heck am I going to possibly do this? Um, but it's necessary if you want to get better. So if you're really struggling and you're on a gluten-free diet already, and you're you know, again, and you're, and you're eating a lot of dairy, this could be one of the major culprits as to why you're not making the recovery or why you're not making the improvements that you want to make. The other, the other thing about dairy is much of the dairy that's produced in the U.S. especially is processed with something called meat glue or MTG, M-T-G. Now, what MTG stands for uh, is it stands for microbial transglutaminase, MTG. I'm just going to pop that up on the screen, microbial transglutaminase. This is an industrial enzyme, and what this the industrial enzyme does is it, um, it, it interacts, so, so we use it as a thickening agent. We use it as, a, as an agent to preserve the shelf life of food. 
And um, and so many of the dairy products have this added as a thickening agent, like your ice creams and, your, and sometimes your um, yogurts and other products. Um, I'm going to put a little link up here for you. Uh, give me just a second here because I want to put this link up so you can read a little bit more about this topic. Uh, because to me, it's it's extremely important that you have information that you can make valid decisions on. But microbial transglutaminase is again, it's one of those it's one of those things that dairy can be highly processed with MTG. And here we go. I'm going to just plug this into the comment box for you. There's an article all about meat lure MTG that you can go back and you can read a little bit more on. Um, but again, what it does, what it tends to do, there have been a number of research studies showing this, is that products that are processed with meat glue tend to create a reaction in those with gluten sensitivity. In other words, it damages the gut, it can create a leaky gut-like response, it can create an inflammatory response. So again, maybe you're gluten-free, but you're not dairy-free, and you're eating a lot of dairy products that are processed with MTG, or you're eating a lot of genetically modified dairy products that are uh, the casein protein mimics the gluten protein, and so you're cross-reacting to the casein. So again, these are um, these are big problems that we commonly see in people going on a gluten-free diet. Now let's talk about another really one that's going to make a lot of you mad. Again, I'm not here to make you mad. I'm here to inform you. And um, and and if that makes you mad, I apologize. No, I really don't apologize. Um, you know get mad but then get over it and uh, and then make change. And I'm going to put another link up here for you on coffee because coffee is the next one. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to drop their coffee and never have coffee again. What I'm saying is that some coffees, particularly like the instant coffees, you know, the, one that, the ones that you can um, like put the powder in the glass and stir it up and it mixes into the hot water. Those instant coffees are one of the worst things uh, that you can do. Much of them, and one of the reasons why, much of them are, um, the problem with them is that uh, they contain wheat. So they have a wheat-based filler or a gluten-based filler. Now that's easy to identify. You can look on the on the label of the product and you can, and you can avoid getting exposure to that wheat-based filler. Um, but there's some more kind of compelling research that's come out here recently on how coffee can actually contribute to uh, a cross reactivity, meaning some of the some of the things in coffee can can actually be the proteins can mimic gluten, and there's this there's this there's this um, there's a scientific term called cross reactivity where the proteins are, or the structures in coffee are similar enough to gluten that some people actually also react to coffee. So some people drinking their cup every morning, you know, they've gone gluten free, maybe they've even gone dairy free, and they're putting like you know, coconut milk or something like that in their coffee, which we're going to talk about the problem with that here in just a minute. So I'm going to take away one more thing from you. No, not really. Uh, just information. Uh, but but coffee in and of itself can sometimes be the holdup. Now, coffee can do other things too. Remember, coffee is a gastric irritant. So some people that, that need to go gluten-free or that are going gluten-free, their guts are, are a mess. They're wrecked. They're, they're leaking. They're inflamed. And, and when you already have an inflamed gut and you put a food in your, in your mouth that has the potential to be an irritant, look, that, that can be a problem. So remember, coffee is very acidic. Um, one of the things you can do to reduce the acidity of coffee is you can put citrus peel in your coffee that binds to the acids in the coffee, and it will it will kind of suppress uh, some of the acidic nature of coffee and make it much more tolerable for some people who have that gastric irritation toward it. But remember, uh, if you're react, if you're still struggling and you're drinking coffee every day, this could be one of the problems. The other one of the other issues with coffee is the caffeine intake. Uh, the caffeine in and of itself can be an overstimulator for the adrenal output, and if your adrenal glands are already fatigued or already shot, uh, coffee can be the thing that sends you over the edge. So you know you've got to be intelligent as you move forward in it. But coffee is is definitely one of the big factors, one of the big big factors that can mimic. The, the gluten or that can create an irritation on an already irritated GI tract that can perpetuate problems. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's talk about coconut milk for just a second. I, I mentioned a minute ago that um, I was going to take away one more thing and I, I promise I, I, I 
not really taking it away. I just want you to be aware. There is a compound called carrageenan, carrageenan gum. And um, oftentimes the coconut milks, the almond milks are basically they're processed with carrageenan. And if, if and carrageenan is, is a gum that's it's generally it's harvested from a red seaweed. And I put a link up for you on carrageenan gum as well. Because again, I want you just to have some some great information where you can get educated and get informed. Um, but you you've got to keep in mind that that carrageenan gum has been shown for many to irritate the gut lining. So it's not again, it's not it's not that carrageenan is gluten. It's not that it looks like gluten or contains gluten. It's that it's a gut irritant for many people. And again, if you're taking in coffee with a milk like a, a milk substitute, like an almond or a a um, coconut milk and it's sweetened with carrageenan gum, you can really, really run into some major problems if you're doing that. So um, it, it can it can slow you down and it can really create a problem. Looks like my links aren't coming through. So I am going to plug that link in right there and see if it comes through this time. There's the carrageenan link. We're gonna throw that coffee link up for you as well um, in the feed. We're having a slow internet connection day. I'm actually, I'm visiting uh, San Jose right now and um, I got out of the hurricane weather in Texas. And uh, anyway, so I'm visiting and so I have a really slow internet connection. So if you're if you're not seeing those links come through, that may be why, uh, why that's happening. So at any rate, now let's talk about the next kind of big mistake and that's the hard to digest foods. The hard to digest foods the big problem with these is that remember we got to go back and we have to say why are we going gluten free in the first place? Like, what is the fundamental premise of going gluten free? Is it for uh, is it for the trend or the fad? No, it's to improve health. And and generally, again, it's it's somebody who's very sick trying to improve their health, and their their pain of their illness is greater than the pain of their diet change, right? Or their desire to not want to change their diet. And so it's not a trend and it's not a fad and it's not something they're just trying to jump on the bandwagon. They're actually concerned about their health. But many of these people with chronic illness who are struggling, what happens? Their gut is a mess. It's again, I've said this before, the gut is already broken. Remember that the act of eating in our country today has been socialized. We, we've taken eating and we've made it a social grace and we've taken it away from what it's actual uh, what it actually is. Remember, Mother Nature is cruel. All you ever have to do is watch the Discovery Channel and see how the lions eat the zebras and, and, and how Mother Nature works. Mother Nature is cruel. And just because we live in a civilized society doesn't mean that we can ignore the laws of nature or what Mother Nature brings to us. Eating, eating is not a social grace. You know, we've made it into that. And many people, you know, they have social uh, paradigms wrapped around their eating and they've, and they've created a culture around the eating. And I'm not saying that you, you can't do that to a certain extent, but you have to go back and remember what eating is. Eating is your gut versus your food. That's in, in the most simplistic common denominator terms, it's your gut versus the food. The food, depending on what it is, right? Um, the food is designed to resist you in a certain sense, to, again, depending on what it is. So for example, many of the plants, and that's what we're talking about, grains, grains are seeds. Seeds are designed to protect themselves and perpetuate their own species. So a seed is not designed to be your food. A seed is really designed to harbor the embryo of its life form so that it can get back in the ground and re-sprout and regrow and perpetuate its own species. It doesn't wanna be your food. And you have to understand that. That's mother nature, right? The seed is designed to shut your digestion down. It's designed, the chemicals within the seed are designed to, to irritate your gut lining. They're designed to shut down your digestion. Now, if you have a, a really super healthy digestive tract, you're gonna win the war. Your gut is gonna beat the seed up. It's gonna win that war and you're gonna go on and you're not really going to harbor such a great problem. But if your gut is already wrecked, if your gut is already compromised, if it's already inflamed, if you're already chronically sick and you're putting foods that are hard to digest in your gut, like a lot of these seeds, remember all grains are seeds, but then there are other seeds as well. And this is part of that family of hard to digest foods. You've got, you know, you've got a number of seeds, chia seed, flax seed. These are things that people are like, hey, put it in the smoothie, put it on the salad. Um, and they and they struggle to get better because they're 
pounding down these seeds that are hard to digest and their gut's already compromised and it doesn't have the capacity to overcome that. And so those seeds can just continue to beat up the gut and to, and to dismantle it and to continue to allow for the chronic and consistent inflammation and permeability in the gut wall go on. And that perpetuates autoimmunity. So sometimes we have to look at the foods that are harder to digest and we have to get them out of the diet for a time. I'm not saying indefinitely. In my experience, it, it, for most people, being relatively seed-free for the first six months while they're going on a gluten-free diet along with dairy-free is a, is a very smart idea. It's a very, very good strategy because your gut has to have recovery time. And if you don't give it recovery time and you just trade one seed for another, trade one grain for another, you're not going to see the recovery or the desire out of the gluten-free diet that you want. You might feel better for a time, but ultimately what will happen is something called gluten-free whiplash. Now, gluten-free whiplash is when you take wheat, barley, and rye out of your diet, and then you put in the corn and the rice and all the other, you know, all the other grain-based foods that are being labeled as gluten-free, and you put those into your diet. Um, usually what happens is you, is you might go a couple of months just removing the wheat and the, and the barley and the rye, and you might feel better. You might actually have some improvements, and that's real common. But then what happens is gluten-free whiplash, and I just put an article link up for you so that you could go read more about gluten-free whiplash. But gluten-free whiplash is when you go gluten-free but not true gluten-free. True gluten-free means no grain. Okay, it means no wheat, no barley, no rye, but it also means no oats, no corn, no rice, no sorghum, no spelt, no teff, no triticale, no grain whatsoever. And um, if, if, you're, if you're only wheat, barley, and rye free, you're going to feel better for the first few months, but then you're going to start backpedaling again, and, and your symptoms are going to start coming back, and many of your problems are going to come back, or you're going to develop new problems. That's gluten-free whiplash. I want you to go read about it because it's one of the biggest mistakes, again, one of the big mistakes I see people make. And the same thing happens with the seeds. Again, the seeds are hard to digest, and that can create a major, major issue. Now, legumes are similar in that sense, too. Legumes can be very, very hard to digest. And so a lot of people struggle, really struggle hard if they're trying to eat a lot of beans the first several months. Again, beans are seeds. And so they contain lectins, and they contain other proteins that are designed, Mother Nature designed them to inhibit your digestion on purpose. That's how the seed survives your digestive tract and gets back in the ground with your poop around it as fertilizer. Remember, that's Mother Nature. Mother Nature, Mother Nature is not looking out for you. Mother Nature is, is designed so that, you know, the seed itself has designed the seed for survival, and that includes survival of your gut. Now, when you take into consideration that we've GMO'd or genetically engineered a lot of these seeds and a lot of these foods that are out there to survive even better, if you're eating those products, you're, you're going to struggle even more. So again, the legumes and the seeds, those hard to digest things, you, you might want to consider keeping them out of your diet aggressively for the first six months as your gut's trying to heal and make a recovery as you're going grain free. The other food group that can be hard or relatively hard to digest are the FODMAPs, F-O-D-M-A-P-S. Uh, that stands for fermentable uh, fructo oligo, uh, dye and money, uh, monosaccharides and polyols that are th what those basically are is those are, those are agents that are carbohydrate based agents that can be very hard to break down. And, and again, one of the problems with somebody who's got chronic gut dysfunction or gut disruption is they have a, uh, they have a weakened gut and they have an altered microbiome because when you're eating gluten, gluten can disrupt the microbiome. And when you've disrupted the microbiome, part of disruption of the microbiome is you can have preferential destruction of certain types of bacteria that live in you, that normally live in your gut. Those bacteria, remember what they do, they help you digest your food. So if you've destroyed certain species of those bacteria that are really good at digesting the FODMAPs, then you become FODMAP intolerant. And so a lot of people end up going on a FODMAP diet because they feel better not eating foods with high FODMAPs. Now, if you, you just Google search FODMAP diet, you'll see there's a whole laundry list of different types of FODMAPs. Now, I want you to understand, not all FODMAPs are the same. This FODMAPs is a family of carbohydrates that are difficult to digest. And some people have hard times digesting certain elements of FODMAPs, and some people don't have, don't have a hard time uh, uh, um, digesting certain elements of FODMAP. So for let me give you an example. Garlic is high in, uh, in FODMAP. Avocado is a high FODMAP food. 
Some people do just fine that have problems with garlic don't have problems with avocado and vice versa. In other words, if you're looking at the FODMAP diet as a tool to say, okay, hey, I'm going to see if removing some of these foods is helpful for me. Don't look at all of them. Think you have to necessarily avoid every single one of them because that you're going to be slim pickings in your food if that's the case. But you might just start paying attention to the ones that are higher in FODMAP and see if you don't notice some improvement or relief if you if you do eliminate them for a time. In my experience in, in helping clients and patients, it's very much FODMAP is not something we have to do indefinitely. It's usually something we have to do for the first six to 12 months. Uh, and that's not with everyone. That's with select people who really have a strong history of antibiotic use. Uh, and they've wiped out their gut flora. They've got a lot of their gluten exposure is, is gut damaging. And so they've got a combination of gluten damage to the gut combined with processed food damage to the gut combined with high level of antibiotic use. And their gut's just a mess and their microbiome's just a mess and they're just not good digesters. They've just lost their capacity to digest. So again, FODMAPs can be one of those things you can look at and, and sometimes struggle with. So, so knowing that can be very helpful. Now, what are some strategies coming back? If we think about, okay, the microbiome is disrupted, what are some really good strategies where we can, where we can come in and say, okay, what, what needs to happen strategically to improve, you know, to improve your gut microbiome? And so one of the things that I really, really like to do, and this is what I do with my, um, with the people that come to see me, is I use a very high dose, very strong dose probiotic. Now, you have to be careful with probiotics, and here's why. Um, some probiotics are grown on dairy. Some product probiotics are grown on GMO corn. You don't want to use those types of products. And, and so it, it becomes very, very important to not use those types of agents. The one I recommend for high doses is called ultrabiotic defense. And I'm just going to plug that link in for you into the feed so you can, you can see that ultrabiotic defense is a high dose, it's, it's over 200 billion colony forming units of, of very, very vigorous um, bifido and lactobacillus species of bacteria, not grown on any kind of GMO culture, not grown in any kind of grain, not grown in any kind of dairy. So very, very important that if you're choosing your probiotic, because I, I've seen a lot of people go, there's, a, there's one particular company that makes a probiotic for, um, they make it for patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and the problem with this with this brand is it's got corn in it. Not only not only it's got corn in it, it's got corn as maltodextrin. So oftentimes maltodextrin uh, is a corn derivative, and so this product has corn in it. So the very thing that the patient's trying to do, which is improve their microbiome through the use of a probiotic, but they're corn sensitive or gluten sensitive, and so they're getting the thing that creates the damage at the same time they're getting a good level of probiotic, but they're getting the thing that creates the damage, so they get stuck in a vicious cycle. So don't use a probiotic if you can't clarify whether or not it's absolutely grain-free, GMO-free. Um, you don't want, remember, remember, probiotics are bacteria. And just like you look for grass-fed beef and you look for free-range organic chicken when you're finding your meats, you don't want your bacteria that are being fed GMO garbage, right? So you want bacteria that are being fed healthy so that they can be healthy so that if you're using them as a source to improve upon or support your microbiome, that, uh, that you're getting the quality that, that's there and not the potential for the glyphosate and the other kinds of pesticides. Okay, that brings me to the, the, next, uh, the next element here, which is the pesticides, right? The pesticides are the other like big, big player in, in prevention of somebody recovering or, or making a comeback. And the reason why the pesticides themselves uh, if we, there are a couple main ones that we'll see. One is called glyphosate. Glyphosate, which you've all probably heard of, Roundup, you know, the government tells you that it's safe. Uh, the company who makes it, Monsanto, tells you that it's safe. Uh, but the reality is we see uh, an epidemic rise in autoimmune disease that, co and, and that coincides with the introduction of high levels of glyphosate in our farming. Now, I know that correlation is not causation. So for those of you who are science buffs that are saying you can't make the claim that GMO is perfectly safe. Look, the reality is this. And this is my experience. In every patient I've ever seen who continued to use glyphosate loaded food products, I saw a lack of recovery or an inability to recover. Take it for what you will. I've treated over 5,000 people in my office in the last 16 years. So I've seen that correlate 
to a 100% degree. We've got to get the pesticide masses out of the diet. One of the problems with glyphosate is it can kill your microbiome. It can kill off certain types of preferential bacteria that help you digest your food. One of the other problems with glyphosate is it disrupts something called the shikimate pathway. Now, I'm going to post another link for you because I recently interviewed Dr. Sinef at MIT on this very topic, topic on glyphosate, you know, because there's a lot of articles, there's a lot of things going going on right now out there that, that talk about, is it really gluten sensitivity the, sensitivity the problem or is it really just the glyphosate? Um, I want to be very, very clear here. It is not just the glyphosate. It is both. So don't go thinking that you can buy a bunch of organic grain if you've been going gluten-free and feeling better and that you're going to somehow not react to that organic grain. I see this all the time. My patients test me uh, to the nth degree. Some of them travel. They go to Europe and say, oh, I ate the grain in Europe and I didn't feel as bad. But then they're still feeling bad because they're still in my office, right? So it is both. It is not just the glyphosate. Is the glyphosate a problem? Yes, the glyphosate is a major problem. But is the gluten a problem too? Yes, the gluten is a problem. Is the grain a problem? Yes. That's the sole reason I wrote No Grain, No Pain. It's not a book about gluten sensitivity. It's a book about the dangers and the detriment of grain as a staple food in the human diet. From heavy metals to molds to mycotoxins to proteins that shut down your pancreas and inhibit your digestion to proteins that create molecular mimicry causing autoimmune disease. Uh, to to the gluten itself, to the pesticides that are being used, to the genetic manipulation. It all is important. So don't try to bargain with don't try to bargain with it. In essence, don't don't just go find something that's glyphosate free and then say, oh, because it's glyphosate free, all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden uh, it's I, it's healthy again for me and I can eat it. So I've just posted uh, a a link to an interview, it's a, it's a, an interview that you can listen to with myself and Dr. Sinef, and I broke down glyphosate. And so again, I want to talk about one of the, one of the agents in glyphosate, it disrupts the shikimic pathway, which is very, very critical because this is a biochemical pathway in your gut or actually in your body, but it starts in the gut. Uh, part of it starts in the gut and that it disrupts your ability to make serotonin. Serotonin is the primary neurotransmitter in the GI tract. 90% of your serotonin is in your gut and it helps with gut motility and it helps communicate messages back to your brain. So your gut brain uses serotonin to talk to your brain brain, right? To your noggin. And if you disrupt that pathway, you can create depression. You can create gastrointestinal problems associated with serotonin deficiency. I mean, look around. How many people do you know that are taking Paxil or Prozac or one of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor medications, the SSRIs. It's one of the most prolifically prescribed medications. Then think about that. It, it's gotten more popular the longer glyphosate has been in our diet. It's another one of those correlations. Again, I know causation and correla correlation are the same thing. But look, we have to think intelligently. We can't ignore the facts around us. And so, um, you know, understand that that glyphosate can disrupt this pathway that disrupts your body's ability to produce serotonin and that serotonin, remember what does serotonin do? It's the primary neurotransmitter in the gut. It's a mood hormone in your brain. It helps to stave off depression. It helps to create sensations of happiness. It helps in, in mood. Serotonin also converts to melatonin. Melatonin is the hormone. It's the neural hormone that allows you to sleep through the night. Many people are struggling with sleep problems or sleep disorders. And this can be part of the reason why. This is sometimes one of the reasons why is that they're not producing enough serotonin because they've got so much glyphosate coming into their diet, they're disrupting their capacity to make serotonin. And remember, when you go outside and the light hits your eyes, it's the serotonin when it is exposed to light through your eyes that is converted to melatonin. So over the course of the day, the more sunshine and more outdoor activity you get, you're making melatonin so that when the sun goes down, you've built up enough melatonin in your brain, to put your brain to sleep. And so if you find yourself and you're, you're wide awake and it's 10 o'clock at night and you're wide awake, this is a possibility, especially if you're eating non-organic foods. So the foods that are, that are not organic, that have the potential for uh, mass exposure or mass dosing of glyphosate. So you've got to keep that in mind that glyphosate based pesticide can be a major disruptor. The other thing glyphosate does is it disrupts selenium and it disrupts cobalt and it disrupts molybdenum. 
These are minerals. Selenium is necessary for thyroid function. Molybdenum is necessary for sulfites. So if you drink wine, if you used to drink wine and you were okay, but you drink wine today and it just completely destroys you, you could very well have a molybdenum deficiency because the glyphosate you're eating is chelating or grabbing onto the molybdenum from your diet and preventing you from absorbing it uh, is a very common, common problem. So molybdenum is necessary for sulfite conversion, meaning it helps us to detoxify the sulfites uh, in the foods that we're eating or in the things that we're being exposed to. Then you have cobalt. Cobalt is a necessary mineral for the formation of vitamin B12 or cobalamin. So you can develop anemia, you can develop all kinds of problems if you have you know, hyperexposure to glyphosate and, it, and it's creating a chelative effect in your diet, causing mineral deficiency. So a lot, there are a lot of different mechanisms that, that theoretically glyphosate could contribute to. Some of them have been studied and some of them haven't been. So what I'm sharing with you is just what I've experienced in patients. It's just what I've experienced with people that have come to see me. And, uh, and, it, and, and, and again, I, I wanna be clear these are potential possibilities if you're getting exposure and you need to be aware of it and you need to be educated about it and you need to take it, proactive steps in your diet and in the way that you're eating if you want to restore your health. And if you're not willing to do those things, that's the price. If you're not willing to do those things, then, then you are willing to pay the price of poor health and that's, that's your fate. So at any rate, there's another pesticide I wanted to talk about today called atrazine. A-T-R-A-Z-I-N-E. Atrazine is a, it's what we oftentimes refer to as a xenoestrogen, estrogen-like compound. Um, and I'm going to put that up there. So atrazine, if we look at where farming, a lot of farmers use atrazine as a weed killer. And so what happens is we get a lot of it in the water. There's a lot of it in our rivers that, that flow into our rivers from the farming communities. And atrazine, what, what, and this, you, if you Google this, you'll find it very easily in the, in the research is that where there's too much atrazine in rivers and lakes, the fish, the frogs, the salamanders, the male ones actually turn into females. It, it, atrazine is so estrogenic, it actually creates a chemical sex change in frogs, fish, and salamanders. And, and, you know, we think about that in terms of humans, right? If you're overexposed to lots of atrazine as a young child, let's just say you're a young boy and you're, you're getting a formula, a formula fed uh, product and it's, and it's, you know, basically been harvested and grown in it. There's a lot of potential atrazine residue in it that is estrogen mimicking chemical. You know, how is that going to affect your sex? How is that going to affect you know, the way you develop, how is that going to affect your testosterone level as you start to develop? And so is, you know, is that one of the reasons why we see uh, an increased rise in homosexuality? I don't know. I don't think anyone really knows, but we do see it in animals. And I think it, I think it's intelligent to look at it in humans. We do know it has estrogen like effects in humans. So you've got to keep that as a consideration. Atrazine is highly estrogenic. And so for men, you know, what do we see? What do we see more and more of? We see low testosterone centers popping up all over the country. For women, we see more breast cancers. We see more ovarian cancers. Why? They're estrogen-related cancers because we're getting more exposure to environmental estrogens, chemical toxic estrogens, or what are called xenoestrogens. These are from things like pesticides, things like plastics, things that are uh, in your cosmetics. You know, these are, these are these xenoestrogens. We're being overexposed, and that overexposure can create big problems in and of itself. So one of the ways we get rid of xenoestrogens is we avoid grain. One of the ways we get rid of xenoestrogens is we avoid eating or drinking out of plastics where, I thought, where at all possible. So, again, it's important that you understand the things that I've talked about today, kind of in summary, we've got, you know, shopping the gluten-free aisle. You know, you're gone, you've gone gluten-free, but it didn't help you very much, or you've gone gluten-free and it helped you initially, and then you hit gluten-free whiplash where you started to rebound. And part of that is because you're shopping the gluten-free aisle, you're still eating the corn, you're still eating the rice, you're still buying the oats, you're buying the products that say gluten-free. That's a bad move. It's a foolish move. Get off that aisle and quit shopping it. Number two, you're eating foods that potentially mimic gluten. The dairies, uh, the way dairy is processed with meat glue, the microbial transglutaminase, uh, coffee that is cross-contaminated or coffee that, uh, again, for some people, there's a, there's a molecular mimicry component. Three, you're eating foods that are hard to digest. There are nuts uh, and, and seeds and legumes. Nuts aren't quite as bad as the seeds and the legumes, especially initially. Those can be very hard for many of you to digest. 
and so they can they can hold up, up they can create a potential uh, plateau in, in your recovery. Again, it's not because they contain gluten; it's because they contain proteins that inhibit digestion, and they're very hard to digest. And then so you've got seeds, and you've got legumes, and then you've got the difficult to digest fermentable carbohydrates, the FODMAPs, right? And so many of you struggle because you don't have a microbiome that has the strength of the potential to be able to properly digest food. And then that creates, again, that creates, every time you eat, that creates a war that you can't win. And when you're not winning the war of eating, you're not getting nourished. And when you're not getting nourished, your body can't receive the nutrition to help you heal and recover and repair. And those are critical, fundamental, foundational things that need to be looked at. So those are the big things. If you if you want to learn more, I really recommend that you read No Grain, No Pain, because I talk about all these things and more in much greater detail. So now I'm going to open the floor for questions. And let's see if my slow Internet connection is feeding your questions in appropriately here. So. Great question coming in from Xavier. Do you think that herbal antibiotics are enough to get rid of SIBO with, of course, a specific diet, or do we need to combine it with antibiotics? SIBO, what is that? SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, for those of you who don't know, SIBO. Um, yes, herbal antibiotics, um, in quotes, right? Um, herbal antibiotics are enough. They can be. One of the most effective ones is berberine. Uh, berberine can be extremely effective. Uh, one of the other things that can be very helpful in my experience with SIBO is is um, is taking a spore based uh, spore based probiotic can be quite helpful. Um, making sure that you have um, that you have adequate one of the things I like to measure is something called secretory IgA, which is an antibody that we produce in our gut lining. It's the first line of defense. And oftentimes, if we, you'll see in SIBO patients, they won't have enough secretory IgA. And that's one of the things that allows bacterial overgrowth to occur. So I use, um, I use, a, I use a product. It's actually one of my own formulations. Um, I created it out of need because a lot of the products that are out there that are similar are dairy-based. Um, so like your colostrum-based products, and some people are just super, super sensitive to colostrum-based products. And uh, here we go. I'm going to pull this up for you so that you um, so that you can see what I'm talking about here. But because I, I do use there are there are good colostrum-based products, but some people are super, super sensitive to. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm just pulling this up for you. Are super sensitive to the dairy, and um, if you're using you know, if you're using the um, if you're using the dairy-based product, the colostrum dairy-based product, and you're sensitive to it, and you're actually struggling, this is actually one of the real common reasons why that can happen. Let's see here. So I recommend that you that you move away from that. If you're super dairy sensitive, you've got you've got to move away from that, and you've got to use a a, um, a it's, it's a serum derived formula. In essence, it's not derived from dairy at all. It's derived from, from serum uh, in its bovine, meaning it's, it's cow based, but it's, it's called ultra immune IgG. I'm going to have somebody put that up for you. Uh, let's see here. Cause I, I want you to, to differentiate. Cause again, most of them that are called IgG support or, or immune support, products that are IgG based, they're colostrum based. It's not what you want. Don't go buy one of those. If you're dairy sensitive, it's going to create a problem. And, um, and, and that problem can be, a, you know, can, can be the thing that prevents you from getting better. So let's see here if I can find it for you. Okay, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to come back and post it for you because um, my internet connection is just running a little bit too slow uh, to get that up for you. But good question from Xavier. Yes, berberine one of the best things to use. I have a product uh, that I really like uh, formulation that is called Ultra Berberine, 
if you go to glutenfreesociety.org. And for those of you who don't know, glutenfreesociety.org is my foundation. And one of, one of the missions of our foundation is to provide uh, high-quality pharmaceutical, grain-free, gluten-free based products for people who are really struggling and trying to get a good product and, 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 and know that they're getting something that's not contaminated. Um, that's part of our mission is to provide that for you guys. So if you haven't been there, go sign up for our gluten-free survival kit. Real easy to do. Um, just, just go to glutenfreesociety.org and uh and sign up for our newsletter and we'll send you a, a gluten-free survival kit okay let's see here moving on through the questions um how do you know if your gut is healthy again i cornelia um a healthy gut is one that digests well you have regular bowel movements one to two bowel movements a day uh bowel flatulence should not be extremely foul um, you shouldn't see any blood. You shouldn't. You should see a nice dark brown uh, and a nice solid stool. Uh, in essence, when you go to the bathroom, you shouldn't have to use up two rolls of toilet paper to clean up. Um, those are healthy bowel movements. That's a healthy bowel function. There are other markers and other measures to determine that. But how do you feel? I mean, are you bloated? Do you feel like your food is digesting well? Do you feel well nourished? A lot of that is very subjective and just in the way that you feel. So. There are, there are parameters that functional medicine docs are trained to measure that can help determine uh, gut health, and that might be an angle that you want to take is, ha is have, a, have a good functional medicine doctor run uh, a gastrointestinal uh, stool sampling on you to, to look at the parameters of your digestion to see if there's any chronic inflammation, to see if you have a healthy microbiome, to see if you have any overgrowth of abnormal bacteria or other microorganisms like yeast. Um, those, are, those are some of the things you can do um, to, to really help to determine that. Okay, Janine, last Friday I went to ER, scan showed a small bowel loop fluid and ileus in the appendicolith. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you meant to say. I did nothing, I had no symptoms, I went for swollen lymph nodes in the groin. Um, and I don't see the question in that. Um, but if you've got a loop a small bowel loop, that's something, I mean, that can be dangerous. Um, I've seen people have to have emergency surgery where they had bowel loops. And what can happen is something called intussusception, which is a process where the, t where the intestines telescopes over a part of the other intestine, and it can create a life-threatening scenario. So you might just follow up with a doc uh, and have that looked at a little bit closer. Uh, Brandon, thoughts on... Dr. John Diard's Ayurvedic approach to seeing gluten sensitivity as an issue with lymphatic congestion, liver, and gallbladder health. He's, he advocates that if we have sensitivity, not an allergy, then it is due to congested galt uh, tissue. Galt is gastro-associated lymphoid tissue. Uh, and by clearing lymph tissue, improving bowel flow, you can return to select grains, non-rich, non-GMO, organic, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, I, I respect Dr. John's work. Um, and I, and I think there's some, some truths to some of the things that he says. However, I, I go back and look at it as why is the congestion there in the first place? Uh, and I look at, so I, here's the way I look at grain in general. Grains, are, are as, grains as a food are not designed for human consumption in mass. They never were. Um, and if you look at, if you read No Grain, No Pain, I talk about all the history of that and, and going back in time and, and, and the myths of, that have been perpetuated in our society about how we've always eaten grain. Even in the Bible, you know, Jesus refers to, to himself as, 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 you know, as the bread, but it was a symbolic reference. It wasn't a literal reference that eat bread to survive. It was a symbolic reference that partake of me, of my body. And, 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 and my message in the way I want you to act as a human and you'll never need sustenance. You'll never want for sustenance. And that, again, that was, a, that was not a, a, a literal meaning. It was a symbolic meaning. You take of the body of Christ, involve yourself in, in, the, in the body and, and that you'll never hunger again. It's not, don't take that as a literal translation. Those of you who are Christian, I am. And, and if you're not, at, you, know, um, you know, at any rate, this isn't this isn't about that, but going back to Dr. John Diard's approach, I don't disagree with him 
a hundred percent, but I disagree that grain should ever have been a staple food in the human diet because when you ask yourself what creates the gastro-associated lymphoid congestion in the first place, it's foods that are hard to digest. It's foods that aren't designed to be digested. Now, some would argue that you could ferment the grain. Some would argue that you could sprout the grain, making sure that it's, you know, that it's, um, that it's, that it's pre-digested in a sense. Uh, and I would say, yeah, you probably could do that, and it probably would be less problematic. However, when you sprout grain, there's more wheat germ of gluten, and wheat germ of gluten is one of the most toxic substances to our joints. So I can't, I can't say that I fully agree with Dr. John, but I absolutely respect his word. And I respect what he's teaching out there in the sense that, look, Ayurvedic is a great, it's a great principle. It's a five thousand year old science of, of self doctoring, and I, and I, and I think a lot of the principles of Ayurvedic medicine are fantastic because they put the power in control of you paying attention to what you eat paying attention to how you feel paying attention to how you digest is the big message it's self-doctoring because nobody can doctor you better than you because nobody has the distinct advantage of knowing what you feel like and knowing what your symptoms are when you do certain things in your environment so um good question Okay, let's see, going down the list. Uh, hard to get gluten-free products here in Jordan. Um, Maze, don't aim for gluten-free products. Go back and listen, re-listen to the first 15, 20 minutes of this video when you get a chance and, and, and don't go looking for the products. It's the products that are creating the problems. Uh, Kate is, is asking for clarity on coffee, coffee, even decaf. Yeah, decaf, just because it's decaf doesn't mean it's good for you too. Um, it can still create a molecular mimicry response or not a molecular mimicry, but a cross reactivity type of response. So even the decafs can be problematic. And remember decaf doesn't mean decaf. It means 97% decaffeinated. And some people who are hypersensitive to caffeine, even with 3% caffeine in the coffee still have very, very big problems, especially if they're dealing with adrenal fatigue especially if they're dealing with uh, gastric irritation already. Even that 3% caffeine can create a problem. Um, Misty's uh, chiming in. I've read that whole food vitamin C is preferable over ascorbic acid. Thoughts? No, I mean, yes and no. So is whole food preferable? Absolutely it is. Should you eat whole food? Yes, absolutely you should. However, you take as somebody who's got a major condition and you need to get high-dose vitamin C in them, cancers, for example, uh, severe gastrointestinal, chronic severe gastrointestinal inflammation, chronic pain problems. Look, whole food is not going to cut it. You've got to get to the medicinal effects of vitamin C. And for that, that requires high dose pure ascorbate. Now, you've got to remember, too, that a lot of the vitamin Cs that are produced here in the U.S., again, corn is one of the things that uh, that is used. I don't recommend corn, uh, corn-based vitamin C products. If you're going to use vitamin C in ascorbic acid form, and, and I recommend them and I use them with, with clients on a regular, regular basis because they're extremely effective, um, this is what I recommend. I'm just going to plug in, uh, I'm going to plug in uh, the name of, it's called Detox C, and I'm going to just put a link up for you. That one is non corn derived. And, uh, and you definitely don't want to go with a corn derived version. And it's important that you look for one that is, uh, that is, that is non corn derived. So that link may be showing up now. Okay. What about buffalo dairy? Same thing. I don't recommend going. Look, if you're going gluten free, go go grain free, dairy free. Keep the dairy out for the first six months. Don't. The problem here's the problem. Psychologically, a lot of you may be going grain free or gluten free, and you get better, but not fully better. But the diet you're finding it's hard, and you're struggling because it's new. And you're not fully committed because you don't know whether it's the right move or it's a guess, right? And so, and so you you you're playing with dairy and you're adding more dairy in because you're you're taking away one food but you're adding in another food and you still continue to struggle. And then you get to a point where like, the heck with this, it's too hard. And then you quit. And then you tell everyone, hey, the diet didn't work for me. 
uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying you as in you, Andrea, I'm just simply saying you as in uh, the people that are out there that where it's failing them. They're, they're not really, they're not committing in the appropriate way. and They don't have a full understanding of some of the nuance of, of, of really going at it and doing it properly. Um, keep the dairy out for the first six months. If you really, really heartfelt on bringing some kind of a dairy back in, go at least six months without it. And when you do bring it back in, bring it back in from cows that are non-GMO, that are purely grass fed, where um, you can verify that the milk is, is pure and clean and there's no recombinant bovine growth hormone and there's no microbial transglutaminase product added to the dairy. And what that really means is finding a local dairy farmer. And, uh, and picking it up very, very fresh. But even that, even to understand this, dairy is a very, even if you're, if, even if you're healthy, dairy is mucogenic, meaning it tells your body to make more mucus. So it can clog up your lungs, it can clog up your gut. And dairy in and of itself, the epidemiological data, meaning all the research, epidemiological research points at dairy as being a major contributing factor for cancers. So it's just not a food group that I recommend that you eat as a staple regardless. Um, for that reason. And if you want to read more about that, you can look at Lauren Cordain. Dr. Lauren Cordain um, published a book on the paleo diet. You know, he's, he's actually the founder of the paleo diet. And, and you can go read more about his work and read more about why you should keep dairy out or why you should consider keeping dairy down to a very, very low minimum at the very least. Okay. Same, so the same thing, Natalie, I'm answering, I think I just answered your question. The same thing applies to goats. You know, goat milk is not really any, any healthier. Remember, humans lose the ability genetically to break down dairy and digest dairy around the age of three when they wean from breastfeeding. It's a genetic reduction in the capacity to break down lactose, the sugar in dairy, and that's why so many people are lactose intolerant. Um, so Kelly's asking, can I touch on vitamin C and corn? Here's the thing: a lot of your vitamin C is produced from corn, so it's it's just they use corn as the as the as the grain to produce the vitamin C, um, and that's why I recommend avoiding it. If if the product doesn't tell you that it's corn free, then it isn't, so don't buy it. Um, again, I put a link up to Detox C, which is which is definitely corn free. We actually use a wild African yam uh, to to source our vitamin C. Okay. If we have any more new questions rolling in, Dean, I wanted to look at his comment. He's, he's Italy gives 125 euro for only gluten free foods. For me, that has celiac uh, is a terrible thing. It makes me want to buy these foods. Um, because it's free for me. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, to me, produce is gluten free. I don't know if, if you can use that 125 euro to go buy, you know, just some meat or to just go buy some vegetables. To me, that it would seem like you should be able to do that as well. Um, but again, I don't live in Italy. I'm not quite sure how that, how that works, but thanks for chiming in and, and, uh, and, and tuning in today. All right. Which probiotics shouldn't you use? <laughs> Polly, good question. Look, I'm very particular. Um, the brands, I, I don't want to talk bad about anyone else's brands. Um, because one, I don't have an intrinsic knowledge of the exact manufacturing process of every company out there that produces a probiotic. And, and, and two, I don't want to say that every probiotic that's out there um, is, is horrible for everyone. I, I just, I can't make that claim because I don't have, I don't have time in my life to analyze every single product on the shelf out there. But I will say this, my, the brands that I use, I, and I have a couple that I use that, that I offer for people, you know, through gluten-free society, and that's Biotic Defense and Ultrabiotic Defense. Those are the brands I recommend for the reasons I stated earlier, is that I can confirm they're not grown on GMO, I can confirm that they're grain-free. Uh, and, and to me, that's very important. I can also confirm that the, that they have the, the way we use our labeling. We don't label the way other people label. So I understand that when I say that Ultrabiotic Defense has 225 um, live viable bacteria that you're getting when you take it, what I mean is that when that product is expired, on the day that that product expires, I can guarantee that you're going to get 225 billion. 
the way a lot of other people label is they don't label based on the expiration date. They label based on the born on date. So they, they may say you're getting 200 billion units, but you're getting 200 billion units on the date of production. You're not getting 200 billion date units on the date of expiration. So let's say a product sat on the shelf for six months and lost 50% of its potency. You're not getting what you think you're getting. And so we label our probiotics based on expiration, not based on born being born. So again, it's, 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 we just believe in transparency and clarity and labels. Uh, Kayla's love the vitamin C and D therapy. My 13 year old and I did it last week. Awesome. Awesome. Hopefully it was really helpful for boosting your immune system. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, you should have tuned in last week. Now just go back and watch last week's replay. Um, can I link to the research on glyphosate, please? I think I posted that. Let me check. I think I did, but I'll post it again. Um, I can. So this was the interview that I did. I did with Dr. Sinef. Uh, just plugging it in there now into the feed, so you should see that popping up. Oh, thank you, thank you, Tammy, for asking this question. What type of drinks do you recommend? I need to replace iced tea and coffee with something healthy. <laughs> I love recommending water. <laughs> Your body is 65 to 70 percent water. What's wrong with it? People say it doesn't taste good or it doesn't have taste. Uh, I'm a more stoic person when it comes to eating and drinking. Drink water. Um, you know, yes, can you do herbal teas? Certainly you could. There's chamomile teas and there's peppermint teas. There's all different kinds of herbal teas that you can consume that are caffeine free that are going to create the irritation. So there's certainly that option. Um, you know, if you if you like a little more taste in your water, squeeze a lemon or a lime or a piece of citrus, like a grapefruit citrus or something into the water as well for a little bit more taste. But whatever you do, don't go buy those little drops. You know, they sell them in the store that flavor your water grape or this or that, because most of those are produced with genetically modified corn. That's how they make the natural flavor uh, in most of those products. Now, um, so I just don't recommend them. You just don't know what you're getting. What does that mean, natural flavor? I mean, I, if, if I'm producing something and I'm putting a natural flavor in it myself, I can verify the ingredient and I can say, yeah, that it's not really, it's not really natural flavor derived from this GMO corn. It's actually natural blueberry flavor from blueberry, right? And that's really what we would want. We want, we want, um, we want water. And if you want to flavor it, flavor it with some some real food flavoring. Um, one of the things that we do at home is we chop up strawberries and cucumbers and we put those in a pitcher and we fill that pitcher up with water and uh, and then we let it sit in the fridge and get cold and, and you know it infuses the water with a flavor that might be more palatable for you, Tammy. So that's what I really recommend. I recommend drinking more water. Yeah, again, water infusions with herbal teas or water infusions with fruits can also be good. Good question. Uh, let's see. I think did I get them all now. Oh, <laughs> there's a whole nother list. We're running out of time here. Um, let's see here. How about soy milk? Are there lectins in soy milk that are harmful to the gut? I don't recommend soy, period. Um, Soy is a phyto, it contains high levels of phytoestrogen and going back to, it's a plant-based estrogen. Going back to what I was saying before, we're so overexposed to estrogens from the environment. Most petrochemicals are estrogen-based. Your cosmetics are going to be estrogen-based. Plastics are estrogen-based. You're getting estrogen through accidental exposure because you're probably eating organic, but you're, you're not eating not organic on purpose, but you're getting accidental pesticide exposure through water contamination you know, even through organic contamination. So we're trying to minimize as much of that excess of estrogen as we can because we got too much and we don't need it. Um, soy milks are highly processed. Most of them, not all, but most of them are GMO. But soy is a legume. And so going back to what I was saying earlier about legumes as being one of those hard to digest elements, the legumes are designed for survival. And so what happens with a lot of these soy milks 
is their legume juice, right? Just like coffee's a legume. Coffee's legume juice too. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier is that you take soy, which is a legume, you make juice out of it, and then you add a bunch of gum to it, right? Because that's what most soy milks are. They use carrageenan gum or they use xanthan gum or guar gum or acacia gum to thicken it. And these gums are really, really hard to digest. If you ever put a piece of gum in your mouth, you start chewing and it doesn't go anywhere, right? It's gums. Gums are harder to digest. They actually uh, pull and, and they pull a lot of water into them as well. So they can cause a sluggish digestive tract. And again, if you're already struggling with digestive issues, that's where that can really come to be a problem, you know, an additional problem. I just don't recommend soy milk. Um, it's not a healthy food. You know, if you understand the history of why so much soy is being recommended, most, most of the soy is being recommended as a health food because the government subsidizes the growth of soy. It's GMO. It's easy. It's cheap. Taxpayer dollars go to producing it. And soy can be, uh, can be made to taste like everything. And so soy is a very kind of unique protein or, or food item that can be used to make fake hot dogs, fake chicken, fake everything, you name it. And it's cheap. Um, they make something called textured vegetable protein with soy. Even though soy is not truly a vegetable, it's a legume. That's what they call it, textured vegetable protein. And uh, and they add that. They add that to a lot of different products. They inject it into a lot of different products because it's cheap. So um, it's just not my advice to go looking for soy as a food in the diet. Now, those of you who were, who were wanting to grow your own soybean or, or you had access to some really organic uh, soy that was fermented like a tofu or miso, Potentially, yes, on occasion. But again, if we're going gluten-free initially and our guts are broken, I just don't recommend soy as part of your initial workup. I recommend keeping all legumes out really for that first six-month period of time. Okay, good questions. Um, Janine, I'm not sure I understand your question. How or can you treat high B6? What does that mean? Are you B6 toxic? If you've got a, high, a vitamin B6 toxicity, the way you treat it is you avoid eating vitamin B6. You, I mean, you avoid taking any more supplements with vitamin B6, but I'm not quite sure I understand your question. There are some genes that play a role in vitamin B6, like Mayo monoamine oxidase uh, mutations or CBS mutations, which um, are B6-dependent genes. Uh, their coenzymes are B6, but I'm, maybe you could clarify your question because I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Uh, can gluten-free foods create high cholesterol? Um, sure they can, but so can non-gluten-free foods. So, I mean, it's it's not, it's not really gluten-free or not gluten-free foods that create high cholesterol. It's the wrong foods that can create high cholesterol. And really the bigger question is, is high cholesterol even a problem? Um, so I think the better question is, is high cholesterol a risk factor for heart disease? And if you followed me for any length of time, you know that my answer to that is absolutely not. High cholesterol has really very little to do with heart disease. Um unless your cholesterol is high to a, an extremely high level. And when we're talking about diseases like hyperlipidemia or um, some diseases where cholesterol is going up over 300, over 350, yeah, that can be more of a problem, especially if there's a high level of inflammation. But cholesterol in and of itself is a very helpful agent. Cholesterol makes testosterone. Cholesterol is a precursor to vitamin D. Cholesterol is a precursor to estrogen and progesterone. Cholesterol won a Nobel Prize in medicine because it was discovered that you needed it to form brain synapses. That's why all these people that are taking all these statin drugs lower their cholesterol are ending up with dementia because they are inhibiting their cholesterol to such a low degree that their brain can't continue to form synapses and they, they, their brain cells are not communicating with each other. So um, maybe a more important question would be is looking at cholesterol as being high, is that really a risk? Is that really a problem? Okay. Can I recommend anything to assist with adrenal fatigue? Are there supplements that help more than others? Um, I have something called Adrenal Ultra Adrenal, which is a, a product with certain vitamins and glandulars to help support the adrenal glands function. Um, Melanie, what I would encourage you to do is subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's, it's youtube.com uh, forward slash glutenology. Um, and in that, what you, what you, uh, will find is a recent video that I did all about the adrenal glands and it's about an hour long. And I, I would really encourage you to go back and watch that. You can also pick that up off of Gluten Free Society. So if you go to glutenfreesociety.org, your web browser will ask you if you want to receive updates from Gluten Free Society, hit the yes button, uh, because you'll get all those updates from us. 
uh, about that information. Anne Marie, as a nursing mother with celiac disease and dairy sensitivity, what should I use as a replacement for the extra calories and calcium? Bone broth is a great source of calcium. Broccoli is a great source of calcium. Realize that you don't need dairy for calcium. Uh, that's kind of one of those marketing myths that's been perpetuated by the dairy industry. Um, extra calorie wise, look, eat real food, meat, vegetables, um, fruits, nuts. Those are all going to contain and should contain the adequate calories, even as a nursing mother for you. You don't need to go gravitate toward empty calories um, from dairy. So um, what I would encourage you to do, Anne-Marie, if you haven't already, there's... Um, there is, in, in No Grain, No Pain, there's a section in Chapter 7 and 8, and it lists out just all the different possibilities of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and meats. A lot of people don't realize, but you've got a few hundred varieties of those things, and there's a lot of choice, and there's a lot of option to choose from, but you just maybe haven't thought about a number of those things. So uh, go check that out, and, and there are going to be a lot of different foods that you can make sure that you're getting adequate calories from. You can also increase your fat intake. Fat is one of the easiest ways to increase calories, uh, but but again, healthy fats. I did a uh, I did a an episode of Pick Dr. Eisler's Brain a few weeks ago on fat, and you can go back and watch that one as well. That's a, that was a great episode where we talked about which kinds of fats were the healthiest. Uh, let's see here for SIBO, you need something to move small bowels. Motility Pro is well. No, and I'm not sure if Dr. Osborne has right. I use something called GI Restore uh, to help push the bowels when we need to, but I also like vitamin C. That's one of the reasons I like vitamin C because it's helpful in so many different ways. Vitamin C is like human duct tape, um, but it also helps push the bowels. So oftentimes it taking, uh, taking medium doses of vitamin C will keep your bowels moving as you're going through a SIBO process. Uh, are my products geared towards adults or can children use them? Yes, children can use them. And if you have a question, look, we're here to help support you. Chime in and, and send your email questions to glutenology at gmail. Uh, I have somebody full time there answering questions about our supplements just to make sure that, that you guys understand what they are and how they can be used to, to support your health. Okay, let's see here. I don't know what you mean, Russell Cho. People are dying in Texas and you're selling this stuff. Shame on me. Shame on you for shaming on me. I'm on the internet helping people. And if you don't like that, you can leave and get out of my, uh, get off my feed. Um, people are not dying in Texas. The hurricane hasn't even hit yet. Um, and I've lived through a number of hurricanes, much bigger than this one that's coming. All righty. Should you be gluten-free with Hashimoto's even if you don't have a sensitivity? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've never met a person with Hashimoto's that didn't have a sensitivity, so I would question, Vicki, how you were actually tested for sensitivity. Um, you know, if you weren't genetically tested appropriately, uh, then you aren't properly tested. And, and so really that's the only real great way to discern whether or not you're going to react to gluten is to have the appropriate genetic testing done. I'm going to put a link in there for you where you can read more about genetic testing for gluten sensitivity. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for answering your question. I find it hard, okay, so Jenny Lamb is chiming in. I find it hard to go without meat, potatoes, rice, iced tea, and chocolate. What can I eat? Again, G Jenny, there are a lot of different foods that are out there. I'm not saying that you shouldn't not eat meat. I mean, meat is a healthy food. There are people that don't do as well with certain kinds of meat, but remember the health of the meat uh, is also dependent on the way the animal was treated. So when you're buying and looking for meat, look for wild caught, grass fed, free range, organic, um, you know, ethically treated animals. Um, you can still eat meat. I'm not a vegetarian and I do not advocate just broad, spe broad spectrum veganism for everyone just because. There are a lot of people out there that do that. I'm not one of them. Um, but as far as rice, uh, it's very easy to get rice out of the diet. You just have to put in the right amount of vegetables and nuts and other things that they can be helpful. Um, so there's plenty to eat. Again, go through chapter seven and eight and look at the lists of foods 
uh, that we've documented out for you. Okay, gosh, the questions just aren't stopping and I'm running out of time. Um, let's see here. Aren't there concerns that the probiotic will be destroyed by stomach acid? Yes, there are those concerns and that's a good, that's a good question uh, to bring up. That's why with probiotics, you do want something that has a coating on it, a gastric coating on it that will get it through the stomach acid. Uh, and again, that's why, again, I, I didn't talk about that, but that's one of the reasons why I like to control which probiotics I'm using and where they're coming from, because I need to know that, uh, that they will survive gastric acid. Okay, do I recommend almond milk? No, not really. I recommend water, going back to what I was recommending for beverages. Now, some people are going to use almond milk and they're going to use coconut milks to, to make smoothies and things of that nature. That's fine. Go ahead and do that. You just, again, be careful of the gums that are added to some of these products uh, and be careful of some of the other ingredients. A lot of these almond milks are sweetened with sugar or flavored with unnatural flavors that are corn derived. So you just have to make sure you're reading what you're, what you're using and, and make sure that it's, you know, that it's clean. Uh, Priyoshka is, is, but Dr. Soy is good for menopausal women, right? No, not necessarily. Um, you know, if, you, if you're just taking in soy, high doses of soy because you're menopausal, because you think you need more estrogen to build your bone strength, because that's one of the myths that's been perpetuated out there, don't do that. Um, if you really are, are struggling or if you're struggling with bone loss or you're having a problem, have your level, your hormone levels measured to discern whether or not your estrogen is high enough because you know soy is not going to be the solution for this. It, it wouldn't be what I would recommend. And again, there are unique situations where you can use uh, organic based soy, uh, soy product or, or soy elements in some situations where it can be medicinal. But again, I'm not going to say that you should do that as a broad spectrum for anyone who's been a puzzle. Uh, question, good question. I'm going to answer it. How can Lyme cause high cholesterol? Any infection can cause high cholesterol. One of the functions of cholesterol is that it's an antibiotic and, and uh, it helps to fight bad bacteria. It helps to fight infection. So oftentimes people with chronic infection will have high cholesterol. And that's another reason why just taking a drug to push it down is oftentimes a very bad idea. Because if you've got an infection and you're suppressing cholesterol because you're scared of heart disease, you're actually suppressing your body's immune system's capacity to fight the infection. Uh, good question. Good comment. My doctor wants me to take statins, but I refuse. Other options. Again, go, on, go back. Maybe we'll do a bit one day on statins, but I've done several videos on uh, statin drugs. So you need to go into my archive and you need to look up, um, you know, cholesterol, high cholesterol, cholesterol, a problem, uh, because you need to get educated about why cholesterol may not be the problem that you've been told that it is. That, that's the first step. I mean, get educated about the myth of, of, of high cholesterol creating a problem. I'm going to post one article I did a while back with a video in it, and, and it's, uh, this one might be helpful for those of you who are worried about cholesterol and getting educated about cholesterol. Here it comes right now. Okay. I got a feeling you guys would keep me on here all weekend. I, I really, I'm going to answer one more question before we wrap it up. Okay. Nora, what vitamins could I be lacking since being diagnosed gluten free in December? Maybe you, maybe does GF mean gluten free? Because you don't get diagnosed as gluten free. You, maybe you get diagnosed with gluten sensitivity. Um, but I'm not sure if you mean something else by that abbreviation. So I'm going to assume you mean gluten sensitivity. Uh, I take a multivitamin B complex, B12, B1, B2, biotin, and probiotics. Um, that's a lot of vitamins unless you've been tested. What I would recommend, Nora, is there are different types of tests. I, the, the one I like, one of the best tests for evaluating nutritional status is called a spectrocell. I recommend doing that test because it will tell you 
whether or not you have a deficiency in all of those different things, because you may not be, need to be taking quite as many pills as you are taking. Again, if your diet is dialed in and you're eating a lot of really solid, real food, that that's going to be you know, that's going to be your best your best bet. But then beyond that, it just depends on what you're deficient in. So um, that's what I would do. I would I would have my doc run run a vitamin and mineral analysis tests on me to to help me discern what that is, so that I can help supplement with whatever my body needed as opposed to just generalizing again generalization can sometimes be helpful but it can also sometimes be not so helpful you can overdose on vitamin b6 it's actually um one of the few vitamins the b vitamins that you can actually overdose on I've, I've, you know it can cause neuropathy so you know take for example somebody who's gluten sensitive and the gluten was causing a neuropathy and then they start taking high doses of vitamin b6 to help and then the neuropathy goes away, but then the neuropathy comes back because over time they, they were taking too much B6 and they actually became B6 toxic and they didn't even realize it. That's just a scenario I've seen play out a few times with different with different people. So taking vitamins in high doses without knowing whether or not you need them, um, it may not be the best or the, uh, the best thing to do. A multi is fine, but but you know adding a B complex and then adding all these other sidearms, you know again it, may, it just may be an expensive urine for you. It may be not necessary, and then again, maybe it was very helpful for you. I, again, testing is why where I like to see people come in is, is let's test it, let's be very objective about it, so that we know what we need. Good questions. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. This was a great, great episode for those of you who aren't yet subscribed. Make sure you go visit glutenfreesociety.org. Uh, sign up for our gluten free survival kit. It's free. Um, you just got to type in your name and an, an email address, and uh, we'll send it directly to you. Those of you who aren't subscribed to our YouTube channel and to our blog, you can go over to Glutenology, YouTube Glutenology, um, and you can also go visit drpeterosborne.com. And if you haven't picked up your copy of No Grain, No Pain, please do. Uh, if, if you uh, haven't picked it up, follow Chapter 7 and 8. Get dialed in with your diet. That way, when you come back, you'll be more educated on how to ask the next sets of questions. We'll be back again next week with another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Have a great weekend. Those of you here in the Houston area, stay safe. Read the post I put out today on surviving the hurricane. Uh, I put out a very, very long post on tips that you need to know about before the thing actually hits, so you still have time to get, uh, to get these tips uh, implemented. And uh, we will see you next week. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.